Stevie Nani here doing the Junkyard Crawl with help from my friends at High Octane Classics in Auburn, Mass. Thank you guys. Uh, has it really been 70 years that Dodge passenger cars have been available with Hemi engines? It has. 1953 was the first year for the arrival of the mighty Dodge Red Ram Hemi. This car's base price was $2,220, just $109 more than the Flathead 6 equipped Dodge Coronet. So $109 for the Hemi, I'll take it. Now here's the thing, you might wonder, what is a Hemi? What's the big deal? Well, this is Dodge's brag brochure on the sensational new Dodge Red Ram V8. And the V we see right here is echoed on the hood, the V, and this actually functions. This is a cold air scoop right here, long before the air grabber or the shaker. This actually functions. We'll look more on that in a second. But what exactly is a Hemi? Well, let's look at this thing here. You can see here that uh, the most efficient automobile engine design in America. Here's the shot of the engine outside of the car and the new 53 Dodge V8, 140 horsepower, more punch per cubic inch. And on the next page, they spell it out, the hemispherical combustion chamber right there. And what it does basically allows the valves to enter from angles that no longer shroud against the side of the cylinder bore. Spark plug fires in the middle for more even combustion. And basically the Hemi dynasty for Dodge starts right here. Now you could still get the six bangers. Here's the red ram from the end, you can see. And it's pretty complicated, double rocker shafts, very long rocker arms, but again, the valves enter toward the center toward the middle, away from the walls where they're no longer uh, shrouded for better breathing. And again, it's all about that magical hemispherical combustion chamber. And, you know, Dodge brought the Hemi back in, what, 2003, 2004 in Ram trucks and then Chargers, um, 300s, etc. And basically a dynasty was begun. So, you know, but again, the six banger was still possible, but again, 109 bucks less. I would take the Hemi any day. So let's open the hood and see if it's still here. Wow, okay, <laughs> there it is. This is the baby Hemi. Now the Dodge Red Ram began at 241 cubic inches, would eventually grow, I believe, to 325. You might say, how come so small? Well, you gotta remember that Dodge, DeSoto, and Chrysler each had their own Hemi family and virtually nothing interchanges. In fact, if you look at this, you'll see that the valve covers are kind of short end to end. That's because the bore spacing on the Dodge block was the smallest of them all. DeSoto and Chrysler were a little bigger each successively. So these things do not have interchangeable parts. The spark plug wires go way down inside there, the Hemi chamber, the plugs way down. And under here are rocker shafts with rocker arms that allow the engine to be as efficient as it is. Now in 1953, first year for the Hemi, nothing but two barrel carburetors, but of course by 1956, you could get dual quads and up to I think 300 horsepower out of one of these things in a D500. Uh, so here it is, the original debut year. Now about this hood scoop, you can see here I can put my fingers through the holes and what this does, it ducts air directly at the opening at the top of the oil bath air cleaner. But again, inside of this, the oil, bleh, <laughs> there it is. But again, the oil would, uh, the air would be directed toward the gap and then would, you know, arrive slightly cooler and denser from the outside rather than from under the hood. But something really cool about Dodge Red Ram Hemis is they had dual point distributors. This is one of the distributors out of these things. Two points, primary and secondary, right there. Again, the idea of this is that more accurate spark timing at higher RPMs. And when it comes down to, uh, you know, most high performance GM engines, dual point distributors are reserved only for the coolest, the bestest. And in fact, in Mopar land, dual points were only on street Hemis, uh, max wedges, on some 383s and 440s, but a dual point on every Dodge Red Ram in 1953 shows that Dodge was very serious about maximizing the spark the performance and the potential of this engine as it made its way. Now, 53 was also a new year, a new body style, no more split windshield, one piece all the way around. Uh, 1952, of course, would have had a, a, a divider in the middle of the windshield. And also 1953 was the first year for uh, integral rear fenders, no more bolt-on fenders for Dodge. And the roof on this, well, a guy named Tex Colbert was the Chrysler, he was the, the president of Chrysler, and he would say, you know, our cars won't knock the eyes out of your head, but they also won't knock the hat off the top of your head. What he meant was he liked a car with a really tall greenhouse because he liked to wear hats, and he assumed the rest of the world liked hats too. So unlike GM and certain Ford cars, which were moving toward lower and lower greenhouses and sleeker styling, Tex Colbert doubled down on the tall greenhouse, again saying that our cars won't knock the eyes out of your head. In other words, they're kind of frumpy, but they 
that won't knock your hat off your head. Well, that was gone. Virgil Exner was just entering Chrysler at this point in time. And by 1955-56, his touch really started to show. And by 1957, the Exner forward look really saved Chrysler and brought them right into the 20th century, as it were, forcing General Motors to play catch up. Crazy, but true. But here in 1953, it was a modern body. Again, one piece quarters. Uh, but again, that Hemi under the hood was the thing. Now we see here on the back, Gyromatic. Well, what the heck is a gyromatic? Well, that was a semi automatic manual transmission, had a fluid coupling, and it would shift in certain gears, but you had to start out with a clutch pedal. So the gyromatic was one of those. Uh, evolutionary steps between the manual and the automatic. The main thing on gyromatic was getting women behind the wheel. Uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, the task of shifting a transmission was maybe one step too far. A lot of ladies didn't like that, but by putting automatics, Detroit says, you know, if we can put automatics and get the clutch out of there, more women will drive and buy cars, and they were right. A lot of men like them too, obviously, because they're convenient. Under the back of the trunk, oh yeah, okay, again, we see signs of the original dove gray paint, uh, the original wheel covers. Here's one of them right here. And again, the V logo, again, that's very, very indicative of the horsepower race. Just getting started, the V8 engine under the hood. Now this would have had single exhaust, uh, no dual exhaust on these things until you get into the four barrel era. Uh, the trunk has fallen through the bottom of this one. Uh, the headlight rings, again, we're talking 1953, when the Korean conflict, that wasn't a war, folks, was heating up or actually in full bloom. Chrome plating was considered, uh, well, it was a strategic material. It was in short supply, so the flash chroming on these things was pretty thin. As a result, it's really rare to find any 1953 chrome of any kind of a car that hasn't begun to flake and pit, and uh, we have it right here. Now, this one here, the original plate S7711, 1970 was when that plate was issued. So this car has probably been off the road since 71, 72, or something like that when that plate expired. Uh, I wouldn't be too surprised if the gyromatic automatic transmission wasn't the reason for this car's demise. Not a bad transmission, but a lot of folks just had no patience for them. And plus, in 1972-3, this 53 Dodge would have been older than yesterday, and not a lot of people would have cared to preserve it or save it. And plus, it was pretty thirsty. That gyromatic uh, was a slippery machine and basically consumed a lot of fuel. A three-speed manual, a straight three-speed with a clutch, didn't have the slip, and the result was better on fuel. So this probably maybe got 15 miles to the gallon around town, which wasn't great in 1972-3. Let's look inside, and yeah, it's pretty well preserved inside. It has the uh, column shifter for that gyromatic semi automatic transmission. Push button radio has the heater, no air conditioning in a Dodge uh, of this era, but uh, just sort of a jukebox design instrument panel. Sort of looks like a Wurlitzer. The only thing missing is the, uh, the, the oil light tube things that. Uh, bubble in time to the music. But again, this is uh, well-preserved inside. Wish I could say the same for the rest of it. You gotta get a kick out of the whole. It's a two-door, a four-door sedan, and the B pillar has come detached from the bottom down here. And keep in mind, this is not a unit construction car. That would come in 1960. So this is still body on frame. Uh, the frames on these are pretty pretty tough. It's conceivable the frame's savable, but the body, well, seen better days. But anyway, this is the story of how 1953, 70 years ago, the first Hemi-powered Dodge passenger car. And the Hemi legacy continues, although there is talk of, you know, the Charger electric Banshee, um, you know, taking over, maybe. But there is a mandate, theoretically, by 2020, or 2030, which is, what, seven years, something like that from now, 50% um, of Chrysler's vehicles are going to be electric. Or may happen, but the other 50% are still going to burn gas. And I've got it on good authority that while the Tornado 6 banger is going to be with us, they're going to develop that, the Hemi engine is not going away. In fact, I've heard that the, uh, the Mexico assembly plant for Hemi is where they make them, is upsizing, not downsizing. That's not something to do with an engine you're going to drop after 2023. Just saying. But anyway, 70 years later, we're still digging on the Hemi power. And uh, one day from now, we'll have a new video right here on the Steve Banks YouTube channel. Hope you join us. And if you like this, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you tomorrow with more Junkyard Crawl.